1938 was quite a year. With wars and threats of wars, Europe was in a turmoil. And in New Deal America, FDR denied that he breakfasted on grilled millionaires and confessed weakness for scrambled eggs. There were protests of playing classical Bach in swing tempo, but the jitterbugs could care less about Bach. All they cared about was swing. And a young man by the name of Corrigan made the nation laugh when in attempting to fly to California, <laughs> he landed in Ireland instead. And in sports, it was a year that saw the Yankees win the World Series. And it was a year for thoroughbred racing. It was a time that saw two of the finest racehorses the world has ever seen. War Admiral, Sam Riddle's astounding three-year-old had swept all before him as he won the Kentucky Derby, the Preakness, and the Belmont, completing his bid for the Triple Crown. And Seabiscuit, a year older, had graduated from the three-year-old class into the more difficult handicap stakes. In 15 starts, he had posted 11 victories and was the number one money winner of the year. Great thoroughbreds like these are rare. And to have two in their top form in the same year, well, it was almost unheard of. No two horse enthusiasts could agree whether War Admiral or Seabiscuit was the better animal. It was only natural that there should be a race. The idea of a contest between the two champions caught the imagination of the public. Arlington Park in Chicago bid $100,000 for the race, as did Belmont in New York and also Boston. Now, match races have always keenly interested American turf followers, but two horse tests between thoroughbreds are perhaps the most difficult to, to bring off. But a date was agreed on and arrangements were made. They were ballyhooed in the race of the century. The magnificent bubble burst when the owner, Howard, scratched Seabiscuit before the race because of uh, what he called weak knees. The racing fans felt cheated, and they muttered some things about owner Howard's weak knees. At the next scheduled meeting of the pair, a half hour before the race, trainer Tom Smith discovered a fever-racked tendon in his colt's legs. And once again, Seabiscuit was scratched. Many felt the race between the two champion thoroughbreds would never be. However, finally, after over a year's planning, the race of the century was finally to be held November the 1st, at Pimlico Racetrack in Maryland. Both horses were pronounced fit by their owners, their trainers, and their jockeys were ready. Both were descendants of Man of War, War Admiral being his own son. And while Seabiscuit was a little further removed. <laughs> but War Admiral, well, he had had a pampered upbringing. While Seabiscuit, he had been treated like a cart horse. He had been sent out like a breadwinner. He had 35 overnight races and minor stakes when he was only a two-year-old. And as a three-year-old, they once entered him in a claiming race for $6,000. No one wanted the homely little son of hardtack. Interest in the event had reached such proportions that people whose only acquaintance with the horse was a nod at the morning milkman were arguing now over <laughs> the admiral and the biscuit. In hushed silence, 40,000 fans watched the two thoroughbreds as they paraded before the grandstand on their way to the starting line. Both horses looked fit. Both riders were ready. A false start right there. Remember, War Admiral's on the inside, and there they go. And Seabiscuit goes right out with him. That's a surprise. I don't think anyone expected that. Seabiscuit on the outside now seems to be taking the lead over War Admiral. And I can guarantee you that's a surprise. Yeah. You might also take a good look at Kurt Singer on this horse, War Admiral, and watch George Wolfe up front. He looks to be a part of the horse going into the first turn. Seabiscuit's out in front by a length. Seems to be running easy. I'm sure this is not the strategy that was planned by the War Admiral and Sam Riddle interests. See Biscuit going into the turn, into the back stretch, still out in front by a length. And you're seeing a riding master right there, George Wolfe. You can see now why he got his name, the Iceman. There he is. He seems to be letting Sea Biscuit take a little breather right now. But you better look out. Kurt Singer's bringing War Admiral up on the outside. It looks like War Admiral's going past him. He is. He's out. He's ahead in front of Sea Biscuit. 
Yeah. Now, Seabiscuit's not giving up. Wolf stays right with him. Now they're head and head. Look at him. Stride for stride. Going around the turn, the far turn. Wolf reached back and strapped Seabiscuit there. Though he might have been waking him up again. Bring him on. They're still head and head. War Admiral now on the outside, Seabiscuit on the inside. Coming right into the stretch, just like everybody imagined. But now Seabiscuit's pulling away. He's out a half a length on top. Now he's a length on top. Now he's two lengths on top. He's pulling away. Look at this. Nobody, nobody, I'm sure, could ever imagine that Seabiscuit could come down and win so easily over one of the greatest four-year-olds in the country and certainly was a champion three-year-old. Seabiscuit, a winner by three and a half lengths. Well, <laughs> there he is, War Admiral. Just about a minute and a half before, he was a champion. Now, <laughs> he walks off by himself, and here's Seabiscuit getting the blanket of roses, uh, getting all the acclaim, and rightfully so. This little Cinderella horse, <laughs> a great one he is. Well, there it was, a race that so many of you have heard about, and I'm sure that many of you for the first time now have seen it on television. It was a historic day at Pimlico, one that few, if any, had ever seen one like it. Two great horses, they're both still great.